The Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 21, verses 5 to 19. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come, and when not one stone will be left upon another, all will be thrown down. Then they asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and this time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, and the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You're all saying thanks be to God. Did you just read what we just read? Did that sound like good news to you? This is Jesus talking. What's he saying we're going to have? The temple's going to be destroyed. Then wars, insurrections. Nation rise up against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Earthquakes. Plagues. Famines. Oh, and before that happens, we're going to be arrested and persecuted. We're going to be handed over. And then our families will stop speaking to us. We'll be betrayed by our parents and even our brothers, our relatives and friends. And some of us will be put to death. The rest of us will just be hated. Does that sound like good news to you? Here we are. It's the lectionary. The reason I'm doing the lectionary right now is for Lambert and the choir, so he knows what's coming and he can pick stuff ahead of time. But here we are. It's the end of the Christian year because the first Sunday of Advent of our new year starts in the Christian year. So whoever at the lectionary decided these few weeks before Christmas, that great celebration of the birth of our Lord, let's focus on the end times, the apocalypse. The word apocalypse literally means revelation. It means the uncovering of something, the revealing of something. But it talks about the end times. And here's Jesus saying to them as they're at the temple, you cannot understand how glorious the temple was to first century people. We're talking about people with dirt floors, no plumbing, little houses, no electricity. We're talking about very simple lives, and they'd go into the temple, and you know what they'd say, whatever, you, whatever Aramaic is that says, wow, they'd be saying, wow. And you didn't hear ever visit a great cathedral somewhere, either here or in Europe. And how many of you remember when Notre Dame burned in Paris? And I hadn't even seen it. It broke my heart to think about that. Jesus is saying, as they're thinking about the temple with its, its beautiful stones and its carvings, and its God designed the temple. And Jesus says, the day's coming when not one stone's going to be left on another. And they're like, wow. Wow. What do you mean by that? He's talking about the end times. And then he says, beware that you're not led astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he. The time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, don't be terrified. These things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. And what are people saying to Jesus all the time? When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? People say to me, we're in the end times, aren't we, Rev? I'm like, I don't know. As Jesus himself said, no one knows but the Father in heaven. And if the Father doesn't share with me, the rest of you have no idea. So here we are with this lovely passage. And it's Stewardship Month. Yay! This makes you just want to open your wallet and give me all your money, right? Right. No. But I think there's some power in this passage if we take a little bit of time to look at what it's really saying. 
I got to understand, I read this a few weeks ago, knowing that the election was going to take place before I read this. What were some of the things that you heard might happen after the election this week? You have to answer out loud if you'd like. We were the end of democracy. That was, that was prophesied by people on both sides of the aisle. If the Republicans win, that's the end of democracy. If the Democrats win, that's the end of democracy and life as we know it. What else might happen? People have been talking about the possibility of a civil war in the United States again, or riots, or insurrections. And haven't we seen an insurrection when we saw January 6th last year, and war in Ukraine, nation rising against nation, Vladimir Putin threatening to use tactical nuclear weapons as if tactical meant not the end of civilization as we know it, earthquakes, and if not earthquakes, then floods and hurricanes and all that good stuff happening, famines and plagues, and a million plus Americans died of COVID in the last few years. I'm telling you what, after having had COVID the last few weeks, I don't want anybody to ever have to go through that. It's a terrible thing to have to live with. And then before that happens, we're all going to be persecuted and handed over and all these other great things. So where's the good news in this? Where's the good news? Because if you look at the world today, there's not a lot of good news out there, is there? How many of you are afraid to turn on the news for what you might see in a day? Or you're going to hear Americans saying desperately bad things about other Americans. So here we are. Let me tell you where the good news in this. Because there is one sentence in this that will give it all away to you. This will give you an opportunity to testify. This will give you an opportunity to testify. This will give you an opportunity to testify. When things get bad, that's when we have to hold on to our faith and the promises of God and Jesus Christ. Now, I've had sort of a bad run of luck lately, you might say, right? Lately, going back about 10 years now. My first knee went bad about 10 years ago. Finally got that fixed after my husband died. Then his dog died. Then I moved here, which was a good thing because I was close to my parents. I didn't know I was going to be this close to my parents. I'm going to tell you that. I didn't ask. I didn't say send me to their church, the church where I was baptized a thousand years ago. But this is where I am, and I'm glad to be here. But I couldn't sell my house in West Virginia, so in the commute, my other knee went bad very quickly. And from my other knee going bad, getting in and out of the car, my sacroiliac decided to go bad. And my shoulder, that already had arthritis, I fell and broke that. Then I got COVID on top of it. Reminds me of a few years ago, I told a story this morning on Bill Brown, who used to be the pastor here, it was when he was serving this church. I was bitten by the donkey at my live nativity and it crushed my finger. It's all right to laugh at that. They laughed at me at the hospital and everywhere else. One of my colleagues in West Virginia wrote, sent it into the connection, the United Methodist newspaper, and said, prayers for the congregation of the pastor who had a finger broken by a donkey at the live nativity that they'll have to hear about this in sermons the rest of the time that the pastor serves there. Bill Brown called me up and he said, how's your finger? And I started telling him, well, it got infected, it's really hurt. It's an all. I said, wait, how'd you know it was me? And he said, I read it in the connection. I said, it didn't have a name attached. He said, face it, Terry, it did not have to. <laughs> Kara has a list of things that she says that happened to me that don't happen to other people. My friend Aline, who is a pastor in Baltimore, called me. She's the one who had brain surgery recently, and she said, I had a tumor in my brain, and I'm doing better than you are. And people have been talking to me like Job's wife talked to him and said, just give up and curse God and die. Because it's been a rough couple of years, I'm telling you that right now. You know why I don't give up? Because Jesus Christ is my Savior, and that what he has promised is true, and I can rest my assurance on that. I loved what the choir sang this morning because they sang part of that great hymn by Horatio Spafford. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like so billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Horatio Spafford wrote that. He was a businessman who lived at the beginning of the 19th century. He had lost money in this great economic upheaval, and his wife he sent on to Europe with their daughters. His son had died some years before. And as they were crossing the Atlantic, the boat went down and he lost his family. And he got on the next ship and he went to Europe to try to 
reconnect with his, I think his wife may have survived, his children were all killed. And as he crossed, he went out onto the ship because people, you know, it was a big news story then and people were looking at where the other ship had gone down. He looked at that scene where that, knowing that his children were under the water forever. And he wrote those words, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin or the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole is nailed at the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. We can hang on to our faith or we can just let it go and say, all right, God, I've had enough. But it gives us a chance to testify, which brings us to 2 Thessalonians, one of the most misinterpreted passages in all of Scripture. Because what does it say? Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. We're collecting food up here for people, not who are not willing to work, people who are poor, because this one line does not negate everything that Jesus taught in the Mosaic Covenant. This is talking about people who said, Jesus is going to come back. I don't have to do anything but sit and wait for him. Because they really believed that Christ was going to come back imminently and that they didn't have to do anything. There were different classes in the early church together. Some people who were poor and who knew what it was to wait on others and other people who had never had to wait on anybody in their lives. And they sort of sit back and wait, you know, somebody's going to bring me my meal. And Paul is saying to them, no, those who don't work don't eat because Christians are not called to be idle. We're not called to be idle or busybodies or not doing work. We are called to proclaim Christ with how we live, how we share our resources, everything that we do. We are called to share, which is why if there's a need at Pedonia International School, we're going to let you know about it. We're going to expect that you're going to meet it. If we have people in the congregation who are in need, that's why we help them out. That's why we have a benevolence fund. We've helped people to stay in their homes here. We've helped people to get a foot up when no one else would let them of anything. So we're going to do, we're going to continue to serve Christ. I told the first service, one of my favorite presents of all time from a church member was a woman in my congregation went to the Holy Land. And she sent me just a little photograph of herself with her hand on a wall. I thought, well, that's an interesting gift. And then she told me it was the Wailing Wall. And she said, I prayed for you. I had someone say, take, I said, take my picture. I want to send it to my pastors. I prayed for her at the Wailing Wall the only wall left at the temple because Jesus was right. In the year 70 AD, it was torn down. And there's a mosque sitting there now, and it's not going to be rebuilt on that place. But there are other churches, aren't there, that have been destroyed? One that comes to mind is one that was hit by a tornado on Palm Sunday some years back. Destroyed half the building, brought the building down on the children in the Sunday school and killed quite a few children including the five-year-old daughter of the pastor on Palm Sunday. Do you know where they were on Easter Sunday morning? They were in the parking lot proclaiming Jesus Christ raised from the dead because his promises are true, his promises are real. And with broken hearts, they still serve their God. So we have a chance to testify, don't we? No matter if you have COVID or you just don't feel like praising God, we're going to praise God, which is why Thanksgiving morning we'll be here. Some of us in jammies, some of us dressed however you want to dress, just come that morning and praise your Savior because that will carry over into your life. And if you know someone who is in need, do what you can to help them. Don't give them a hand up. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. Help them in the name of Christ your Savior because he was raised from the dead. He's coming again. Everything will be revealed, but until that day, we are called to proclaim him and testify to his truth. Amen, amen, and amen.